We have a super special guest today, David Coleman, that is a CTO at Extreme Networks. We are extremely humbled and honored to have David. So David, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have me and Matt, directors of ECSE and product marketing here at Ekahau, joined by Steve and Dale, our SE's sales engineers in America. So welcome everyone. It's superb to, to have you here. Thanks a lot for joining us and let's enjoy the amazing content that mostly David has prepared for us. So Matthew, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're talking about a very exciting topic and we all know there's lots of innovations and lots of new things that come with Wi-Fi and we're actually going to be talking about what's going to be coming next for Wi-Fi in Wi-Fi 7, what it means for us and our wireless network. So David has got a fantastic insight into what is coming, all of the new features and how it may or may not impact how we design our wireless networks or how we configure them. So we've got tons of great content to cover there with David. But before we do that, we thought we would maybe set the scene, Mac, of where we are right now in Wi-Fi. Totally, guys. So let's quickly recap where the Wi-Fi started. So the first standard was introduced in 1997 in 2.4 gigahertz era. So even though we have 802.11a introduced in 1999, 2.4 gigahertz was still dominant. And in 1999, actually, we had both 802.11a and 802.11b introduced, but most chipsets, they were actually working in 2.4 gigahertz band. And that trend continued until 2003, where we had the equivalent to 802.11a introduced, but in 2.4 gigahertz space, that is 802.11g. So here we are talking pretty much just about 2.4 gigahertz with some exceptions, but this has changed massively in 2009. So Matthew, talk us through the five gigahertz era. Yeah. So even like Max said, when, when Wi-Fi first come around, we pretty much was most of the devices were operating in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So you can maybe call that that 2.4 gigahertz era. But really in 2009, with the introduction of, of Wi-Fi 4, 802.11n is kind of where we felt that breakthrough of more five gigahertz capable devices and people really started to take Wi-Fi a little bit more seriously about being able to use it for our business critical applications and main moving into like that main form of connectivity. So we kind of classed the Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, and even potentially a Wi-Fi 6 that came out in 2019 really is this five gigahertz era. But what is really exciting is this new era that we're moving into now, the six gigahertz era, um, the support of 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6e in the six gigahertz frequency band. And then Wi-Fi 7 is also going to be supported in 6 gigahertz as well as 5 and 2.4. But I don't want to take too much away from David's slides coming up very shortly, and he'll be talking us through what is big around Wi-Fi 7 and that frequency band. But talking about something that's big and new, we had great announcements at Wi-Fi Day around our new optimizer features, and we wanted to let everybody on the webinar know today that you can actually access the new optimizer features right now. So if you go ahead and sign into the Echo Insights, which is the cloud, you can actually go and take a look at your projects inside of Optimizer and play around with that before and after slider to see how you can improve the performance of your Wi-Fi networks. And you may see in there as well some cards that you need to start the optimizations for simply just by clicking on Optimize and then you can get access to uh, playing around with these new features. So really excited to have these features available for you all today. So go and try them out. Okay, Doug. So thank you, Matt. Optimizer, guys, is like your expert in your pocket. So it's extremely easy to use and you use optimizers to fix and optimize your existing Wi-Fi networks. It's just two steps. You take your sidekick for a walk around your office, around your premises, warehouse, industrial space, outdoor space, whatever. You can use whatever survey mode you, you want. A stop and go, continuous, just go, survey without maps, our new amazing addition to the, uh, to the team, uh, autopilot or GPS, and then you just save it to the cloud. Go to the cloud, ekahow.cloud, and that's where you can have step-by-step -step recommendations about how to fix and improve your networks. Exactly, and that's how your networks will look when you go into Optimize. You'll see a lot of cards there around different criterias that it's being checked against. And if you follow and implement those recommendations from Optimizer, you'll see you'll go from having some red and some yellow issues to everything being all green, all nice, and all good, how we like it to be with our Wi-Fi. So without any further ado, let's hand over to David, and he'll take you through everything that's new with Wi-Fi 7. And yes, Optimizer will work with Wi-Fi 7 as well. Yeah, and um, yeah, perfect. Can you, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Of course. Okay, and then let's hit it. 
Uh, hi, everybody. If you don't know who I am, my name is David Coleman. I'm with the Office of the CTO at Extreme Networks. Uh, link up with me on LinkedIn if you can. Uh, and also uh, check out Extreme Networks website if you're not familiar with Extreme. Well, um, please do. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And off we go. So um, yeah, I really like the slide uh, you fellas had just a minute ago where you talked about the different errors of Wi-Fi, and you called it the six gigahertz era. And so consider that stolen, because I've actually been talking about that for the last couple of years. We're in a kind of a, a new paradigm shift, and that's the error of six gigahertz. <clears throat> it started with, excuse me, it started with Wi-Fi 6C, and we'll continue with Wi-Fi 7. And depending on what country you're in, uh, you have X amount of new frequency space available for Wi-Fi. So right now you have all this new frequency space available, about 480 megahertz in Europe, for example. That's effectively the same size as five gigahertz. And in other countries, you may have all of this, all 1200 megahertz of frequency space, which is effectively double um, the five and 2.4 band combined. We also hope that there will be spectrum harmonization in the years to come, meaning we hope countries in Europe and other areas that don't have the full six gigahertz of spectrum, that their regulatory bodies will join the party as well. So um, so everybody should keep your fingers crossed for that. And, um, and but bottom line, I'm excited. I'm excited about six gigahertz and what it means for the Wi-Fi industry and what it means for uh, users of Wi-Fi because it really is a game changer. So with that, um, the next thing I want to point out is the client ecosystem has really grown significantly that support six gigahertz radios. Um, as a matter of fact, there is now over close to 2,000 devices that have a six gigahertz radio in them. Well over, I think the number is closer to now to about 125 smartphones and tablets numerous laptops from every vendor you can think of. They're even putting six gigahertz radios and television sets and um, data collection devices like Zebra devices. And now we're starting to put Wi-Fi 7 client devices are starting to come out. So, um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, but the ecosystem is growing uh, for, for support for six gigahertz, whether they're Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7 devices. So the timeline, you guys saw a similar slide before, the, the error, the six gigahertz error kind of started in 2021 uh, with the introduction of Wi-Fi 6C, but when is Wi-Fi 7 coming out? Well, the Wi-Fi 7 certification from the Wi-Fi Alliance is not yet a thing. Uh, I think you, can, you will see that happen sometime next year. Um, so stay tuned for that. But are, you probably already heard about Wi-Fi 7, and the reason is there's already products, consumer products. Um, there's no enterprise products yet, per se. I think there's been one or two announcements, and you'll see other vendors like Extreme make announcements about their enterprise APs that will be coming in 2024. But the only thing that you can purchase right now is consumer-grade stuff. And that is very typical in the industry. It always comes out before the enterprise stuff. But you can go to Best Buy or whatever your uh, uh, local electronics dealer is and buy these right now. Keep in mind, these are not certified for Wi-Fi 7. So they may not have all the bells and whistles I'm going to talk about here in a minute, but they are available. As a matter of fact, clients are now starting to become available. So I actually bought a, a Google Pixel 8 and just came in the a mail the other day. There's also uh, a couple of other smartphones. One or other two smartphones that have Wi-Fi 7 radios in it. And you can actually purchase this Intel BE200, which is a Wi-Fi 7 radio that you will start seeing in laptops in the coming year. But you can actually purchase that on Amazon right now. So uh, the Wi-Fi 7 clients, which will have 6 gigahertz radio in them, they are starting to hit the marketplace as well. It's early days, but they're starting to. Keep in mind, these aren't certified yet, but Wi-Fi 7 certification is coming soon. And so Wi-Fi 7 in itself uh, is kind of the marketing name. It's really the uh, more common name for the common man for what it was labeled 802.11BE, which is the latest IEEE draft amendment uh, called extremely high throughput. I'm not sure what's coming next. Uh, uh, maybe ludicrous high throughput or 
um, in the next draft and uh, or Wi-Fi 8, whenever that comes out in four or five years. But uh, Wi-Fi 7 is going to be based on 802.11be. It will operate on all three frequency bands, 2, 5, and 6. And there's some features. There are some new features, which we're going to talk about in this presentation. So Wi-Fi 7 is based off of uh, some of the mechanisms that are defined in 802.11be. So let's let's get into this. Let's get into some of the features. Um, I think um, before I get into that, I think I'll, I'll just kind of go ahead and state right now what my main conclusion is. And my main conclusion is, is that Wi-Fi 7 is going to have some new bells and whistles. But really, the real, real value is the continuation of the availability of 6 gigahertz for Wi-Fi. That is... Once again, the paradigm shift and Wi-Fi 7 is just going to be a boost to that. Um, Wi-Fi 7 is kind of dependent on 6 gigahertz, quite frankly. And it has some new features. <clears throat> some have a little bit of value. Some have potential. Some not so much. And some I personally, and I, you know, I am very opinionated. And some of these features, I think, quite frankly, are more consumer-based features. One, for example, is that you're going to hear a lot of hype about is 320 megahertz channels. Okay, yeah, there will be 320 megahertz channels available. I've actually seen this on some consumer products. But if you're in Europe, that means you only have one channel available. And by the way, even if you have all 1200 megahertz of frequency space, that does not scale in the enterprise. So that's great for, you know, a home device, okay, to have a big giant channel to modulate a lot of data, but it doesn't really scale in the enterprise. One thing that concerns me about 320 megahertz channels, and for that matter, also 120 megahertz channels, is something called OBSS interference. So if you look at this slide right here, this is a... a a depiction of a 160 megahertz channel that all, also you find you would probably never use in the enterprise, but you could would probably use on the consumer devices. Uh, the problem with that is if somebody lights up on a consumer grade device using a 160 megahertz channel or a 320 megahertz channel, you may have a 40 megahertz channel or even an 80 megahertz channel in your enterprise deployment nearby that will be within range of that consumer device. And what that will lead to is primary and secondary channels uh, not aligning. Um, this is pretty much guaranteed to happen. So um, this is another reason I'm not very um, key on these big giant channels, at least for the enterprise, but they do hold some value if you're at home and far away and you're not interfering with your neighbors. If you want to learn more about OBSS interference, um, go ahead and uh, you can check out these blogs that I've written about it in great detail. Um, I don't have the time on this session to get in exactly what it is, but I'll just summarize it. If you have ch channels, uh, competing APs that are nearby and where their primary and secondary channels do not align and, um, and they actually conflict with each other, it actually will have a serious hit on performance. So I highly encourage you to read these technical blogs for more detail. The problem with these big channels, if somebody uh, pops up one of those consumer grade devices near the enterprise, you're guaranteed to have OBSS inter interference. So once again, 320 megahertz channels, sounds great in theory, um, it'll work, but it's a consumer grade feature. Another thing that I've already seen work is uh, Wi-Fi 7 feature is 4K QAM. So yes, once again, we have a new, uh, uh, more intense modulation uh, procedure. Uh, modulation, um, we'll be using modulation and coding schemes based on 4K QAM. So if you're looking at these uh, QAM constellations right here, and you can see kind of a timeline, uh, 4K QAM or 496 QAM will give us these, once again, um, a lot more data on a single modulate, a lot more data on a single sine wave um, and effectively give us, you know, uh, you know, another 20 percent boost in throughput. Um, sounds great. Um, it'll work, um, but you're going to need a pristine RF environment. So you're probably going to need an SNR of about 40 or higher dB. Um, for uh, 4K QAM to kick in. 
Um, I've already done a little bit of testing on it and it does work, but you, it's going to work on six gigahertz. It's highly doubtful it'll work on five gigahertz or 2.4 just because they're too noisy. And you're going to have to be in very, very short range of your access point. Um, and bottom line, very, very clean RF. Uh, pristine environment, which is doable in six gigahertz. And if you're, you know, within five, 10 meters of your AP, it's doable. So this, it, it does have a little bit of potential of the enterprise. But once again, I think this is more of a consumer grade feature. Now, the, the main feature that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, that I think will hold both uh, potential for both consumer side of things as well as the enterprise things is multi-link operation. So I want you to think multiple bands and multiple channels, okay? Um, imagine if you could, uh, an AP, Wi-Fi 7 AP could communicate with a Wi-Fi 7 client um, using an 80 megahertz channel from six gigahertz and a five, uh, 40 megahertz channel from five gigahertz at the same time. Uh, you could also include 2.4. Okay, um, so um, this is new. This is what is probably the biggest potential enterprise feature. And it has several different potential goals. So there's literally four different methods of uh, MLO. I'm gonna focus really on two of them, but the three goals is um, you could use th uh, a method of link aggregation to give you higher throughput maybe like a five gigahertz and a six gigahertz link, link redundancy with redundant data to increase reliability or link steering to lower latency. So let's talk about these in a little bit um, more detail. So the one, the MLO method that you're going to see hyped extremely is going to be the MLO method. It's called STR, uh, which uh, is a data aggregation method. So think if you're sending X amount of data on the six gigahertz radio and X amount, even more data, uh, different data on the five gigahertz radio, um, and you're sending this data down to a Wi-Fi 7 client or possibly in the other direction. Well, when you gobble it and put it all back together, you've aggregated that data. It's going to give you a lot greater throughput and sounds wonderful, okay, in theory. Um However, I'm going to be brutally honest, I don't, at least in first-gen chipsets, and I don't hold a lot of uh, hope for this on the client side. You'll see some interesting demos that show you how this works in controlled conditions um, and getting unbelievable throughput using the aggregate data capabilities. The problem with a client is uh, this working with a client in the AP is medium contention. So imagine... Um, this has to have a fair amount of uh, synchronization. So imagine if a six gigahertz client, uh, uh, the radio is open, the medium's open, but it has to wait on the five gigahertz radio. And then when the five, um, that wait time in itself might actually cause your throughput to go down. So in theory, this sounds great, but this is, I'm going to have to see this in action first. Um, however, so I'm not holding a lot of hope, at least initially for this on the client side. However, there will be a use case um, that will, this will absolutely work. And that is mesh. So think of an what's called an MLO mesh, where your mesh, maybe you carve out a six gigahertz channel and a five gigahertz channel from your channel reuse pattern, and you just use it for mesh backhaul at the same time. Well, you're effectively, you're going to have a lot more data. You could have a, a 40 megahertz channel on 5 gigahertz and an 80 and 6 gigahertz. You're backhauling that data. Um, and if you're not competing with clients for, um, for medium contention, you're going to aggregate that data. And uh, I have already seen some numbers um, showing um, a throughput of, uh, you know, 5 gigabits per second um in, in some cases so and potentially even higher so i do believe this will be a use case in the enterprise i also believe you will see um um some of the consumer grade companies that have these three or four sets of wi-fi routers that you can buy as a set and a couple of them are, are meant as mesh units or um 
you will see them use this capability as, as well. So I do see a lot of potential for this, the aggregation component, but more as a mesh play as opposed to a client play. Now, in terms of clients at communicating, with APs using MLO, there's a different kind and uh, the clients will support this and it's called link steering. So imagine a client that is two by two listening uh, with its two radio chains and whatever becomes available first, transmitting uh, um, on one of the bands. So uh, maybe listening with a one by one on six gigahertz and a one by one on five gigahertz and whichever band becomes available first, transmit with the two by two on the six or transmit on the two by two on the five. And this going back and forth like this, this link steering uh, could potentially happen on a per packet basis. Now, the value of this is this will greatly lower latency. So you're gonna hear a lot of talk about some of the applications that are gonna be enhanced performance um, or were actually being built for to operate with Wi-Fi 7. And probably the one you're here, gonna hear a lot about is AR and VR because there's intensive latency requirements. This will absolutely lower latency and in some cases actually uh, raise your throughput a little bit as well. So do um, I do see a lot of potential for this. Once again, um, this is uh, you will actually have separate MLO SSIDs. I'll talk more about that, that later, um, but it does hold potential between client and AP communications for link steering. That so with that, let's can I yes, sir. Uh, Absolutely. We have questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So first question is from Matthew. What is the impact of mixed client environments? Would AC or N clients disrupt the ability to use MLO? Well, I mean, you're still going to have to use the protection mechanisms, right? So, and you still have to contend for, for the medium. So, especially on the legacy uh, bands, 2.4 and 5, I mean, the protection mechanisms with RTS, CTS, they're still going to be in place. And that, that for that reason right there is where I don't hold a lot of uh, promise for client to AP communications for MLO aggregation. Okay. And do you have any thoughts, assuming that we have the support for clients to AP communication using MLO, how it would impact the battery life on a mobile device? Uh, how it would impact the battery life? Um, uh, no, I mean, that remains to be seen. Obviously, uh, all the chipset vendors have given that a lot of thought, as well as the smartphone manufacturers. Um, so, um, you know, I, I've already started playing with a couple of these phones and uh, I have not seen, and I've turned on the EM, it's called EMLSR, um, which stands for Enhanced Multi-Link Single Radio, which is the fancy technical term for link st uh, steering. And I have not seen any dra extra drain on the battery life, but I mean, it's early days. So, um, but I, no, I don't, I don't necessarily see that, um, especially with the link steering. Or play. Thanks, David. Okay. Uh, great questions, by the way. Um, keep them coming. So a few more Wi-Fi 7 thoughts. Um, I'm going to go through three or four of these slides very fast. Um, OFDMA, we all know, is part of uh, Wi-Fi 6 and uh, 6E and 7. There's been some enhancements um, to OFDMA. It's called multi-RU. There's one called small. There's one called large. Small is just to uh, take more advantage of, uh, so there won't be unused frequency space where you can actually have two RUs assigned to a single client within a 20 megahertz boundary. That's called small multi RU. And additionally, there's something called large uh, multi RU uh, that doesn't have to be contiguous that will actually have a um, be used in conjuncturing with something called puncturing, um, which was originally defined in Wi-Fi 6, but will be required in Wi-Fi 7, where you can puncture out a hole in a large channel for like one RU. So if there's some sort of interfering device um, and you had an 80 megahertz channel, but that interfering device was only causing a problem at 20 megahertz, you could puncture that 20 megahertz and still use the rest of that 80 megahertz. So this has potentials to help with OBSS interference. It also has potentials to help with um, AFC and puncturing and using AFC uh, together when we have standard power. Um, I think this is a long way out. Uh, you should know that a standard power in AFC is fairly imminent in the United States 
but still has a long way to go in other countries. But it, there is potential here. Um, I do see a resurgence in five gigahertz, um, dual five gigahertz and uh, various uh, SDR modes for radios. So maybe you're not ready to go to six gigahertz. Maybe you decide to go to dual five. And then as you get uh, more six gigahertz clients, so you can turn one of those five gigahertz radios to a six gigahertz radios. So you'll see vendors have a lot of different modes, uh, uh, software defined modes. Uh, for dual five scanning capabilities and moving forward. So I, I, I expect more SDR modes. Wi-Fi six features, I think will continue to thrive in six gigahertz, even better than the legacy bands. So, you know, over the years, the last, I don't know, eight, you know, a couple of generations, AC um, and AX, we've gotten all these new features and would in some, some way had more benefit than others. OFDMA, let's be honest, we've only seen about a 5% benefit, maybe a little bit more to, up to 10% in the legacy bands. But uh, in a pure OFDMA network in six gigahertz, we uh, we are already starting to see, and we do expect better performance using that technology. And as I mentioned previously, there's some new enhancements to the resource units and how they're aligned with the multi-RU capabilities. So hopefully that uh, the use of that will only get better. Now that being said, not all not all features are are um, as we know, and a lot of you know, um, not all features are equal. Multi-user MIMO gets hyped quite a bit. It does have uh, its place it, in, it, with Wi-Fi. It works very, very well in bridge point to multi-point bridging solutions where everybody's stationary. But in high density uh, environments, we all kind of know it just is kind of an overhype feature and we haven't seen that much value in it. And don't get me wrong, multi-user MIMO works very well with other RF technologies. And as I pointed out with point to multi-point bridging, uh, you will hear some hype that there's going to be 16 by 16 MIMO radios. Uh, that's not going to happen. I mean, somebody might build one, but I mean, that's just that's just if somebody wants to sell you an eight thousand dollar access point. There's no value in that uh, whatsoever. But uh, uh, bottom line is, most of the Wi-Fi seven APs that you see, see will be in the typical form factors that we were already used to. Um, either uh, four by four by fours or two by two by twos for value tiers. So uh, let's, you guys are, are all, at Echohow are all about design. So let's talk about some design considerations for six gigahertz and um, in the six gigahertz error um, and with Wi-Fi seven as part of the consideration. So I wanna reemphasize that you don't have as much frequency space in some countries. However, there are plenty of channels now to do a 40 megahertz design by default in Europe. Um, so uh, there's no, I highly recommend using 40 megahertz design in Europe until Europe gets more frequency space. And when Europe gets more frequency space, I hope they can do what we're doing by default in most cases in the United States, which is 80 megahertz design, where you can actually have a, a reuse pattern of 14 channels. Um, Due to some of the power spectral density rules, it's actually advantageous now to use wider channels, which where you can modulate more data. So uh, I never would have said this in five gigahertz, but with six gigahertz and the availability of all the frequency space, we can do this now. I do definitely want to talk about uh, wired implications because at the end of the day, there's always a piece of copper somewhere, right? So um, now, uh, I'll. This, I've been talking about, you've been hearing people say for 10 years that a multi-gig link, a one gig link up from an AP up to a switch is not enough. And vendors have been making that claim for 10 years. And for 10 years, it hadn't really happened. Uh, other than some corner cases of the last couple of years, usually one gig uplink has been enough. I am going on record that absolutely you're going to need multi-gig now. Um, especially if you're going to use mesh, um, because I've seen the data, I've seen the throughput that goes on a MLO mesh and you're talking five gig. So I'm going to be recommending for future, if you future proofing purposes that you, you're probably going to need to upgrade your switches, um, uh, maybe a little bit sooner than, uh, later, um, um, 
I've not made that recommendation in the past, other than to just say maybe future proof, but right now it's probably going to be a little bit more imminent if you plan on using the mesh capabilities of an MLO. So in most cases, I think a five gig uplink will be enough. Uh, will we need a 10 gig uplink? Maybe, um, you know, maybe depending um, on uh, the mesh backhaul that is achieved, uh, you might actually need that as well. But I think five gig, five or 10 you are hearing some people talking about fiber uplinks. Um, believe it or not, some of the consumer grade stuff has fiber uplink, fiber ports on them. Um, in the enterprise, maybe you'll see fiber ports on like outdoor devices, but I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But multi-gig is, is finally going to be a reality. Think, um, think about that when you're uh, in your switching infrastructure, okay? Um, look, there's a for example of a, TP-Link with its fiber uplink port. Um, once again, the more important conversation for wired uh, integration is going to be P PoE. Um, gang, the days of uh, standard power of just plain old 15 watts of ether uh, PoE are over. Um, you need uh, PoE plus, uh, AT power at a minimum. Um, two by two by two APs, they'll work. Uh, pretty much with full functionality with 25 watts, not so much with 15 watts. Um, four by four APs, um, you're gonna need for full functionality, you're gonna need 30 plus watts. So you're gonna need BT power. And um, every vendor will have some sort of downgrade functionality um, by turning off ethernet ports or radio chains where they might be able to operate um, on AT power, but just understand that uh, uh, power is consumption is um, it's is growing and for, um, um, with these new chipsets and more radios. It's just a, a matter of fact. You will see vendors do special things to try to minimize power and and uh, for sustainability reasons. Um, in off times, for example, powering down radios. But um, I'm more concerned with your power budgets. Make sure you have enough power because in today's world, we power a lot of things besides APs, like uh, lighting, right? And, and, and things, PoE lighting, for example. So uh, the last thing you want is PoEs randomly rebooting, and they will randomly reboot if they don't have enough power. Uh, you've heard me talk about this before. The number one support call that Extreme Networks gets is APs randomly rebooting, and that's usually because they're not getting enough power. So this is a consideration, whether it be Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7. Uh, please, uh, power budgeting is very, very important. So that uh, um, I, I think we're doing actually pretty good on time here, which leads me to the topic I really wanted to spend the most time talking about, which is the Wi-Fi 7 security. Um, and okay. uh, in this case, shall we shall we pause for a second? Sure. To Go for it. The audience. Okay, Go cool. Uh, we have a question from Todd. Uh, what happens to Wi-Fi 6 slash Wi-Fi 7 capable clients using a service like Edge Roam and they jump bands, hard drive? Okay, um, all right. So that is part of the conversation that's coming up. So uh, hold that, hold the answer to that one. Okay. Uh, cool. Let's let's continue then. Mm -hmm. Okay. But no, that's directly related to this topic. <laughs> okay. And uh, I get asked it all the time. All right. So... Um, Bottom line, Wi-Fi 7 security. So let's talk about that. Um, it's really six about, it goes to several topics here. It started with six gigahertz, um, meaning with 6E, when six gigahertz was introduced, they decided no WPA2, period, and no open security, period. So your choices are WPA3 enterprise, WPA3 personal, or you can use OWE, or also called Enhanced Open. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that, but uh, bottom line, you're probably going to, you have to use WPA3. Um, you're not, there is no support for WPA2, okay? Which kind of goes to the question the gentleman or, or lady had uh, just a minute ago. So um, let's, let's talk about this in great detail. So let me tell you what, our guidance is going to be in, um, oops, um, I actually have slides out of order. Okay. So, um, so let's look at this historically. 
WPA3 has been around for three and a half years, right? And so you could use it on the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz span. And that sounds great, um, but um, you can use what's called a pure WPA3 network, or more than likely, you're using something called the transition mode that allows for WPA2 clients and WPA3 clients to connect to the same SSID on these legacy bands. That's where transition modes exist. So if you turn it on, the WP, any WPA3 capable client that has come out in the last three or four years will absolutely connect to that SSID. If, however, will a WPA2 client connect to that SSID? Maybe, it might be able to connect to an SSID like Eduroam, but maybe not. It might do this and you start having connectivity problems and uh, it just doesn't connect. Now, the reason is simply driver. A lot, even though you have this transition mode on, there's a lot of um, older devices that get freaked out when you turn on WPA3 transition modes and they just have connectivity problems. And we've seen this, especially of the early days of implementation of WPA3 in the legacy bands. Now, fast forward to six gigahertz, okay? With six, so this is the guidance that I have been giving everybody for the last year, two years. Because of what I just told you and the connectivity problems uh, due to turning on transition modes, I our guidance has been this. You know what? For now, use separate security on six gigahertz in the legacy bands. In other words, use, you have to use WPA3 on six gigahertz and you're still gonna use WPA2 on five gigahertz, okay, uh, or and even two point four gigahertz. Now that means separate SSIDs, okay. That also means there's no interband roaming between five and six. Now I believe this guidance has been smart for the most part the last two years, but I'm opening up to this. And what I mean is, I'm opening up to using with eight hundred two dot one X WPA interthrize with transition mode being able to turn that on as well. So that would that is what you're gonna have to do uh, with Eduroam. Now, I haven't gotten to the MLO yet. I'll get there in a minute. I'm just talking six gigahertz and five gigahertz in general. And the reason I'm opening up to this is the client populations are, uh, with WPA3 uh, support for even the legacy bands have grown significantly. And some of the numbers we're starting to see is that close to 90, 95% of clients should be able to connect on the legacy band, support WPA3 on the legacy bands as well. I'm just telling you right now, if you have a boatload of really old clients that are eight, nine years old, you may have problems. Um, so for an Eduroam SSID, this is what you would probably do. Um, and this is probably the only the, the only thing to do. You would have a WPA3 Eduroam SSID on six gigahertz, that matching Eduroam SSID on five gigahertz using WPA3 with transition mode. If you want to have six gigahertz connectivity, okay. If you can wait a little bit longer and not have Eduroam on six gigahertz, maybe wait another year. Um, you can still put other things on six gigahertz and then make Eduroam of, and still use WPA2 on five gigahertz uh, for Eduroam and then maybe switch to WPA3 in another year. It's just how comfortable you are with your client population. Uh, by the way, um, I am not a fan of guest access on six gigahertz. I see no reason to use that valuable frequency space. Um, I, I, more and more and more, I'm believe that you should use six gigahertz for mission critical applications for your business or for your university. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of different SSID strategies depending on the vertical. I think you're going to see healthcare, for example. I think you'll see mission critical apps that run only on six gigahertz because of the clean, pristine RF environment. But once again, even though our guidance has been for to have separate SSIDs, I am open to doing this with WPA3 Enterprise as support for more clients grow. Let me do warn you of one more thing. I am not open to the transition modes for WPA3 Personal. Um, and the reason is, is two completely different protocols. 
WPA personal uses PSK. WPA th uh, three personal uses something called secure authentication of equals. It's a much better protocol. It's more secure. It's, it's the same user experience, but it's very, very different. And uh, the data that we have seen and the experience that our customers have seen that if you turn on transition modes um, in the legacy bands with uh, WPA3 personal, you're going to have more problems. With 802.1x, the only difference between WPA3 and WPA2 is management frame protection. So just keep that in mind. There's no one solid answer to this. Um, that, uh, But Another thing uh, that you need to think about is um, there's other strategies too. So, I mean, this is another strategy that I've proposed regarding Sorry, this as well. Can we stop for a sec, mate? We have like a sure, two go ahead. questions that are super relevant to the previous slide. First question, uh -huh. Joshua, what are the ramifications of using separate security on the WLANs, but broadcasting the same SSID? Does it make sense? Separate security on WLANs, but broadcasting the same SSID. So you can theoretically configure different security methods on different WLANs, let's say on a alternative. Yeah, system. yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. So I view that as a hack. So um, so uh, that is uh, another thing you could do for Edge Your Own, for example. Okay. You could use this, you could use WPA2 with what the same SSID on five gigahertz and W with Edgerum SSID and WPA3 on six gigahertz uh, with the Edgerum SSID. Uh, and there will be inner band roaming, but it's not really roaming. It's kind of more like hopping between the bands. I'm not gonna say it won't work. It does, it will kind of work, but it's not guaranteed to work, you know? And um, so think of it, it's it really it's completely different security. So you're actually setting up a different security mechanism when you're hopping. Um, it'll work. We there's been some people that like Mark House that has blogged about it about um, you've seen it work successfully with some clients. But I view that as a, is kind of a workaround, quite frankly. Um, what where it also fall where it also falls apart. Let me just finish this one thought here. Where it also falls apart if you turn on something like eight or two eleven R and fast and fast BSS transition, it gets so complex. The roaming uh, from interband roaming is it's not going to be it's not going to be a happy day. So okay, so what would you do? I, I would advise against it. So is what I'm saying. So. Okay. Okay, um, and the previous slide you had the BYOD SSID name that was the same in five and six. Uh, oh, that's because David screwed up his slides. <laughs> I see. That should say B Y. That should say BYOD dash six. So that's why you have people on these webinars to keep me honest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, um, that's not my intention to uh, call you. On. I thought yes, sure. but but. Um, that brings me to uh, two things, okay, that we need to talk about. So number one, so let me actually fix my slide real quick. We can watch and... the master in action. I love seeing behind yeah, the scenes yeah. here. No, 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 I just, I want to <laughs> fix this. That was okay. a good call out from, uh, from one of our attendees, uh, Nick. Yes, it was. Yeah, now, we highlighted it there earlier. It was like, yeah, I wonder. All what right. There. Now, I'm going to come back to that slide. Okay, I'm going to come back to this one. All right. Now, but I'm just talking six gigahertz now. Now, when I'm talking six gigahertz, here's another design that we've had a little bit of success with. Okay. I wouldn't necessarily say do this for Edge Your Own, but maybe a mission critical app. So one of the things is uh, six gigahertz isn't going to have the same effective range as five gigahertz. Okay. It's just a matter of fact. So what we've seen is some people have done one-to-one -one replacements and what and there might actually be some dead zones for the six gigahertz so what we've you can do maybe you have a mission critical app and maybe that mission critical app you choose you create a wpa3 um uh um ssid that's on six gigahertz and five gigahertz, and there's no transition modes, meaning you're not gonna allow any of the older clients to connect. This is just for a mission critical app. But effectively what this will do is while the client's roaming between six gigahertz, if it finds its way into five, into a kind of a six gigahertz dead zone, it can 
very easily fall back to five gigahertz because it has the same security. Um, and so we kind of call this a, a, an alternative design, five gigahertz for roaming and six gigahertz for capacity. And we've had some success with this. Now, I wouldn't recommend this necessarily for edge of roam, but it could be for like a mission critical app. Now I wanna say one more thing on this topic, and that's this. It gets even more complex when you start talking about MLO, okay? So if you turn, so like uh, some of the MLO is probably gonna be off by default. And the MLO that you'll be able to turn on on the APs will be the link steering MLO um, that you'll probably use be using with clients. So if you create, um, now if you're creating one for uh, aggregate link MLO for mesh, that's a different topic. But for client connectivity and you create an MLO SSID, that has to use WPA3, okay? And that in itself, opens uh, up a whole, a whole nother can of worms. Um, and we just don't have enough data yet to, to find out how that's going to impact um, legacy clients that also want to participate. They won't be able to participate in the MLO communication. So bottom line is my guess is um, probably my guidance, uh, and I might change this in six months, but probably my guidance is going to be if you turn on MLO for the link steering, that you turn it on strictly with W, you'll have to use WPA3 and you use it strictly for Wi-Fi 7 clients, probably not transition modes, okay? So keep that in mind. So this makes it even more complex, okay? So I would not recommend turning on MLO for Eduroam anytime soon until we have more data. So great questions, but I, I tell you, it kind of goes to the whole conversation um, about, in general, um, regarding uh, six gigahertz, uh, Wi-Fi seven is just going to bring some new questions, mainly around MLO. Um, but um, it also is an opportunity, and this is what I keep telling people: think of six gigahertz as an opportunity to rethink how you do Wi-Fi in the enterprise. Okay, do you necessarily need to do everything the way you've done it before? Do you have to absolutely duplicate that in six gigahertz? Okay. So for example, and, and I know people are going to argue with me and everybody's welcome to opinion. And by the way, there's nothing written in stone. Different verticals will have different needs and, and different um, design strategies. But I mentioned earlier, why would you put uh, guest networks in six gigahertz? I, I just guess traffic. I just don't see it. You know, um, the guests will be perfectly happy on five gigahertz. Okay. 2.4 gigahertz is a waistband. We know that. Um, but the guests will be, in most cases, perfectly happy in five gigahertz. They don't need six gigahertz connectivity. And now that might change, or you may have a reason. But, you know, if it was my business, I don't think I'd have a guest SSID in six gigahertz. Um, um, we need to rethink things like that alternative approach I showed you, maybe a design for um, uh, uh, different SSID strategies, um, depending whether it's EDUCAUSE or you want to design for roaming and um, uh, capacity at the same time. Um, it's going to depend what your client population. It's going to get even more complex um, when MLO is introduced into this. I'm, I'm a big believer now that I think more and more and more that we're going to start putting certain applications on, on an SSID for mission critical apps and putting them just on six gigahertz and segmenting them by frequency. Okay. Um, yeah. You're going to have to think more, maybe even differently on how you do site surveys for six gigahertz. So I, you need to think differently. You need to think differently about POE, but don't, don't view this as being tougher. Just view this as an opportunity. And then I'll just say this. I get asked this all the time. Why don't I just wait for Wi-Fi 7? Well, I'll just wait for Wi-Fi 8. Uh, guys, there's always a new model car or truck available. You know, you buy one and there's a new model out the next year on the lot with a few new bells and whistles. That's kind of what Wi-Fi 7 is. Um, this truck right here that I bought, think of it as a Wi-Fi 6E truck and it came with an exclusive highway. That exclusive highway is Wi-Fi is the 6 gigahertz band. Wi-Fi 7, the Wi-Fi 7 model will also have that exclusive highway, the uh, the 6 gigahertz band, but it'll have a few new bells and whistles like multi-link operation. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, features are great. Um, and I'm always excited about new features and capabilities, 
but really for the next 10 years, uh, what we'll be able to do with six gigahertz, whether it's 6E, 7, Wi-Fi 8, or Wi-Fi 9, whatever comes along, it's the spectrum is the paradigm shift. And with that, uh, I think this is my last slide. Um, shameless plug, if you want to download this free ebook that I wrote, Wi-Fi 6 and 6E for dummies. The next thing you're going to ask is, when is Wi-Fi 7 for dummies coming out? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe next year. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've, as always, I've enjoyed my time here, and I think we actually have a little bit more time for questions. Amazing. David, thank you very much. And please don't retire before you finish writing the book about the Wi-Fi 7. And guys, this guide <clears throat> is like about 100 pages long, and this is the best resource, in my opinion, to learn more about the Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Great to learn from that. It's So what, what Dave is doing, he's like spending his evenings instead of enjoying himself, reading the standard <laughs> and doing tests in the labs and then extracts this information into easy to digest format that can be found in a book like like that. So that's that's absolutely great. Okay, so yeah. let's go back to our slides fast. And guys, another, well, shameless plug for Extreme, but it's also great for us as well. If we are Extreme users, we have a new functionality available from Akahow where you can export floor plans and access points straight from Akahow to the Extreme dashboard. So Matthew, show us how it's done and talk us through how it works, man. Absolutely. So all you need to do is uh, upload your project file. It's got your measured survey data from your extreme access points collected with the Psychic 2 to the Echo Insights portal. And then the only thing that you need is your extreme cloud credentials to the IQ. And then what you can do is you just click export and then you can actually push the floor plans and their measured AP locations in their real positions straight to the extreme cloud IQ dashboard, which saves our Echohow and combined extreme customers so much time of not having to manually provision and drag and drop access points to their locations. Another really cool thing that you can do is you can actually push the latest heat map that you collected from your survey with Echohow to the Cloud IQ dashboard. So if you want to view it in there, you absolutely can. So um, really loving this integration and the features that we've got together. So Mac, we've got some questions that we think the audience might have around Echohow and Wi-Fi 7. So why don't we try and answer them quickly and then we can then push some of those great questions that are coming in in the chat and Q&A back over to David. So first question, Mac, will the Echohow Psychic 2 support Wi-Fi 7? I think we've had this question in the chat earlier today. And the answer is, drum roll, of course. So guys, like... It doesn't, the, the most important thing here is the frequency pretty much. So when you do a passive survey or whatever, uh, when you take the Wi-Fi measurements that make, you know, all the heat maps heat up and you can use that to troubleshoot, fix, or think about the network, it's all controller management. So it really doesn't matter. Even if you have all the device, you can still um, capture newer generations of Wi-Fi for as long as they are on the same frequency. Next question. Exactly. Which the Psychic 2 is, 2.45 and 6 gigahertz. So I think you're future-proof there for 10 years, I think David mentioned. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> ne next question, AI Pro. Will Echo AI Pro support Wi-Fi 7? And of course it will. As soon as there are enterprise-grade access points supporting uh, Wi-Fi 7, you will see them available for you to start planning and designing inside of the Echo AI Pro software. So Mac, and, yeah, we lastly, have some other applications, right? Of course. So will my survey, Echo survey application, mobile app, support Wi-Fi 7? And yeah, you guessed it. Of course, we will support uh, Wi-Fi 7, probably before it's even an official thing. Yep, exactly. And there's a really great question that came up during David's presentation um, in the Q&A around um, channel widths to use in 6 gigahertz and what issues we may face with the PSE channels. And we thought, you know, what a great question that was. And actually our next webinar is all going to be around 6 gigahertz and client network and discovering the client how clients, sorry, how client devices discover six gigahertz network. So if you're interested in this kind of um, new frequency and the intricacies of how the protocol is going to work in different client devices, we have a great guest in Rasika joining us to talk us through that. So you can sign up here on this QR code to get access early to that webinar link. And on that note, I think there are plenty of questions in the Q&A. Yeah, so if I could just chime in on that topic, I actually see that question from Harold. Yeah, you mentioned Europe might start with 40 megahertz channels and six gigahertz wouldn't 40 megahertz channels and six gigahertz face issues 
with PSCs. And what Harold's referring to is uh, preferred scanning channels. Only every other 40 megahertz channel has a preferred scanning channel, which I'm sure you guys will cover much deeper in your webinar. I'll just say this, uh, it, it should work okay. Uh, um, because by default, the primary discovery method is um, uh, out of band discovery using RNR information elements that you'll learn more about in this forthcoming webinar. And that's on by default and supported by all clients. PSC is an optional method and PSC, although most clients support it. Um, that being said, I will make one recommendation um, is that on your six gigahertz SSIDs that you turn on 802.11k, 802.11k will also enhance uh, the roaming capabilities in six gigahertz. Perfect. Okay. Stu, Dale, feel free to come back and show your beautiful faces to the webinar audience. I know you've been keeping a close eye on that Q&A during the webinar today, and we can perhaps ask David a few of those questions since we've got a couple minutes left to spare. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Um, great for answering that one about Harold, because that was the one um, I had queued up there. Um, the other one here, which is actually interesting, that um, it's kind of an older terminology. You saw it from uh, Christopher uh, Cooper's as well, the in-band duplexing. This is an old terminology, I believe, uh, Dave, the I IBFD. Is this a type of uh, MLO? Uh, I mean, it's more of like... Uh, uh, no, like, there was talk about terminology. using at the physical layer, using a full duplex kind of stuff. But that er, that technology keeps getting pushed out. Um, there, um, there could, I mean, there is talk about uh, the aggregate links could be potentially... Um, synchronous or asynchronous, which, you know, with in one of the cases would be kind of a pseudo full duplex, but having full duplex in itself, um, no, uh, uh, RF is still half duplex, so. Okay, great. And there was one last one here, which was, where did it go? Du, 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 du. Oh, it just disappeared off my screen, hang on. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, and, we have quite a, quite a few you, questions. You might have to disable, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So right, we've that covered one. these two. Okie doke. So starting from the top, uh, can you use MLO only on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz? Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't see why you couldn't. Um, you could. Um, you could. And by the way, why, I mean, there's like I said, there's different kinds of MLO. So yeah, you could configure it with uh, whatever bands you wanted. Additionally, for the aggregation, let's say you did an aggregation for mesh, it doesn't even have to be on separate bands. You could aggregate uh, a, a maybe a 40 megahertz channel in the lower five gigahertz band together with a 40 megahertz channel in the high five um, upper band of five gigahertz. And you can yeah. have an MLO mesh in five gigahertz. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be across bands either. So. And so does that mean that you recommend using MLO in 2.4 gigahertz band, David? No, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I see MLO mainly for five and six. I, yeah, I, no, um, you know, there's always use cases, but I, I, I see it more of a five and six technology, but um, I've been, I've been wrong before. I mean, I, I, to me, I view 2.4 gigahertz as a best effort band. So of course I is. don't think I'd, you know. Okay, since we're discussing MLO, let's drop another question about the MLO from Joshua this time. So um, can you do MLO across access points without dropping packets when roaming? How does that work? I feel I feel bad now. MLO across access points without roaming. Yeah, so pretty much how does roaming work with MLO? Is it still similar? Uh... That's a good question. Um, I think it's still, I don't think the roaming mechanisms are changing, but uh, to be honest with you, I, I have not tested it yet because literally I've started playing with the technology last week. Um, um, we're just starting to get our hands on it uh, with the consumer stuff and, and some of the uh, beta equipment and the enterprise side. So I don't think the roaming mechanisms change. Um, I have seen the association process for uh, EMLSR. Um, uh, that process occur on six gigahertz when I had a, a five and six gigahertz length. Um, so that's a good question. Um, you know, you're giving me something to do some packet captures on, but I don't think the roaming mechanisms in themselves have changed. So 
So to be determined is the answer. <laughs> so, you know, I'm so look, gang, you say, I, I unfortunately I have a hard stop, so I'm going to have to go. But I, I'll just say this. One thing that I've learned about all this new tech when it comes out, I'm all, I, I'm, an, I'm an evangelist for the technology. I'd like to get excited about the new technology. Six gigahertz is what I'm most excited. But am I excited about some of the new Wi-Fi 7 bells and whistles? Yeah, to a certain extent. But I've always said this publicly. I never believe anything until I see it field tested. And right now, a lot of us and a lot of people like yourselves will be testing it yourselves in your home labs, things like that. But I promise you, once Wi-Fi 7 finds its way into, into the field and into actual real deployments, we'll learn new things. We always do. And we're, we're still learning new things about 6 gigahertz in general. And, you know, that may, some people may not like that answer, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, sometimes stuff that works in a lab doesn't work in the field. Multi-user MIMO being the perfect example. So I'm sure if we had this webinar one year from now, there will be some things that I said today that I'm going to do a complete 180 on <laughs> um, when we have the next webinar, or I will like put an asterisk to what I said before. So, but um, I'll take one more question, um, Mac, and then I really got to go. So I apologize. But... No problem. So okay. there is a question then, uh, a okay. question about the SSID's configuration and SSID's configuration best practices, what are the SSID strategies that I should be thinking about? So how do you configure your SSIDs across multiple frequencies? Different ones. There's different strategies. I'll just, I mentioned all of them um, very quickly. Number one, uh, SSI, um, the guidance that we've had for now if, to be safe is separate SSIDs and security on six and the legacy bands. Use WPA3 and six and separate SSIDs on five and 2.4. Um, uh, which, um, and that's because of the connectivity problems moving forward. I'm okay with using a WPA three SSID on six and five, and maybe even, um, six and five, as long as you turn on the transition mode in five, there's enough clients out there where transition mode should work, but just be aware that some clients might not work. Another strategy is a uh, third strategy is, uh, to have separate SSIDs and six gigahertz for just a certain application, like uh, healthcare, for example, some mission critical app that's life and death, just have it run on six gigahertz, not the other bands, because you have the clean spectrum. A fourth strategy will be um, maybe you're using, um, um, oh, by the way, don't you, I'm not a big believer on the transition modes for WPA3 on uh, personal. Um, and I'm not a big believer in OWE uh, transition modes because it requires two SSIDs, and that's just stupid. Um, and um, the fourth strategy was that thing I said, maybe you have a WPA3, pure WPA3 SSID on five and six with no transition modes for some sort of acquisition. And that uh, is for using it for capacity with six gigahertz, but you have a fallback to roam to five gigahertz in case there's a dead zone in six gigahertz. And finally, the fifth strategy is what are we gonna do with MLO? You're probably gonna to have to have a separate SSID for MLO clients, um, but I reserve the right to uh, adjust that strategy as we learn more about MLO. So there's five different strategies. One size doesn't fit all, if that makes sense.